So we're off. Um, let's get started. I've got, I think, people coming in. So yeah. uh, I'll begin by acknowledging that we're hosting this webinar from the lands of the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to elder, elders past and present. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I know a few of you have been coming in. There'll be more coming in over the next couple of minutes. A few technical glitches to get us started, which is always nice, but um, we've got a great panel assembled. Uh, Fergal Coleman is my name. I'm a director here at Symphony 3. As usual, I'll be joined by John Nevins, who is an advisor to the Symphony 3 business and has over 25 years in local government. He'll be known to most uh, for his time as CEO of the city of Kingston. John, how are you? Raring to go? Fergal, looking forward to our panel's discussion. Great. Um, for those of you that don't know Symphony 3, uh, Symphony 3 was established in 2011. We're technology experts with a deep understanding of local government. So we've worked with uh, over 80 local governments over many years. While people are coming in, I'll, uh, I'll take you very quickly through the agenda and then I'll hand over to John to, to um, introduce our panel. So very quickly, a series of, uh, I guess, over the next hour, uh, you'll bear with me for five minutes as I just take you through an overview of the series. Uh, I'll then hand over to John uh, for the panel discussion. He'll introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, we'll talk to each panelist for about five minutes themselves, and then we'll open it out to a more general conversation uh, and then finish off with some uh, closing remarks from John. Um, as usual, please keep the questions coming. So this is, we want this, I suppose we haven't overly scripted today, John, we want to make it a general discussion. We're welcoming argument and um, thoughts and comments. As normal, the session will be recorded. So if you've got any uh, issues with that, please, please just let us know. This is part of a webinar series that most of you will, a lot of you have attended the previous sessions. We've created this series to elevate the digital transformation conversation in local government. So the seven sessions that we're running, we'll take a break after today till after Christmas and we'll be back in January with a, a session on empowering employees. Importantly to add that we've based this around our, our maturity, our digital maturity framework. So, each of the webinars uh, relates to one of the streams you can see that down on the, um, the left-hand side there. So the idea being that each, each webinar looks at a different piece of the jigsaw puzzle um, and over, over the course of uh, seven webinars, you know, you'll put together the whole jigsaw puzzle that you'll be able to take away with your own council and, and hopefully start implementing some of the ideas that we discussed. So today's session is around citizen service. John, with that, enough from me. I'll hand over to you to introduce our panel and um, get the discussion going. Thank you, Fergal. Good afternoon, everybody. For local government, <clears throat> serving its uh, citizens to the best of its ability is their main goal. Um, citizens are the key consumers of local government services, and citizen, but citizens' expectations are increasing. Evident, and ev there's evidence of local government's awareness of the importance of serving their citizens' needs and of this increasing uh, citizen expectation. If you look at most local government council plan publications these days, you'll find that council's articulation of its focus on its citizens, often expressed as citizen centricity. To talk about this today and help us understand and under, unpack it, this focus by local government on citizen centricity, we have with us a, uh, a panel of uh, experts in their respective fields. Um, let me introduce them. Firstly, we have Rebecca McKenzie. Rebecca is CEO of uh, City of Glenora. Most people in on this webinar will know Rebecca, not only for her role as a CEO, but also as a past president of LG Pro, and I believe you're chair of the zoo's board as well, Rebecca. I am, I am. It's a bit, so, they're a bit like councils, but they have lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Rebecca. Also with us today, we have Jolene Shimpri. Now, Jolene can hear us, but there's a technical glitch with uh, the video, um, vid Jolene's video connection. But Jolene is Director of Customer Relations at the City of Melbourne. Um, looking forward to what Jolene, you have to say, Jolene, particularly in the context of 
everything that the impact of COVID-19 and uh, citizens, uh, citizens' services and their expectations. And finally, our other esteemed panel member is Colin Fairweather. Colin is known to many, many people in local government as well. Colin is an expert uh, in technology. Uh, he's the former ch Chief Information Officer uh, at the City of Melbourne. So welcome to you as well, Colin. Thanks, John. Okay. Now, to kick things off, Rebecca, uh, this morning, the, uh, sorry, the, <clears throat> the, the approach this morning is each of our panel members will talk for about five minutes, and then we're going to open it up for discussion. And to commence proceedings, Rebecca, would you like to uh, bounce the ball? Sure. Thanks, John. And um, Fergal, can I add my acknowledgement of the traditional owners to yours as well? And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And I know that there's a, um, at least one or two of my colleagues that are on the call today, um, plus lots of others. So can I say from the start that I'm not professing to be an expert in any of these, but I have an opinion on all sorts of things, and I'm happy to share it um, with you today. Um, and I was also reflecting on um, Fergal's jigsaw that he offered um, up before in terms of how the series is going to pan out. Because I think for me, citizen centricity is a really important one. And I, I would have drawn the jigsaw slightly differently. And I would have put the, the citizen centricity in the middle. Because um, for me, that's really why we are here. You know, that's why we exist. And all of the other stuff, the technology and the systems and the processes and all of that, that's actually some of the how. That's how we actually deliver our commitment to um, our citizens and our communities. So. I've been asked to sort of focus a little bit on kind of why this focus and why is it actually, is it different now to how it's been in the past? And I've got three really quick propositions to put forward in my five minutes. Um, one is I think that the world has changed. Two is I think that our sector has changed. And three is I think that actually our residents have changed. And so I'll just quickly touch on each of those. So in terms of um, the world has changed, of course, COVID has um, really impacted over the last couple of years. You know, we didn't see it coming. It came and hit us hard. We've flexed and we've adapted and um, we are certainly not the types of um, society that we were two years ago. Um, but over that period of time, you know, we've been embedded in local. We've walked every last inch of our five square kilometres from our home. Um, and as we've done that, we've actually noticed things and we've formed a view and an opinion on things that we might never have even noticed before. Um, and largely it's about local services and things like that. And that's, you know, kind of brought the focus onto local government. And I think that our sector has changed um, as well. You know, local government, we're really known for being fast followers. And um, if we think about citizen centricity and those sorts of things, you know, the Local Government Act is now very much sending us a very clear message about the expectation of our communities um, and, that, and that local government will be citizen led. So you'll have all gone through processes of doing your community visions and council plans and those sorts of things. And the level of engagement um, that we have been driven to do um, you know, has, has really shifted and, and changed. Um, the local government performance reporting measures, you know, many of those are directly driven now by um, customer experience and the local government satisfaction survey is really a continual reminder um, that it's just not just enough to um, provide good services. People actually need to think that we provide good services as well. Um, so there's that element of perception management. But I think, um, you know, really what is important is that our customers have changed and their expectations have changed. And this isn't something that's just occurred because of COVID. This is something that has been occurring over a period of, I reckon, at least 10 years. Um, and it's that shift from local government being, you know, a largely a patriarchal um, kind of model of government where we knew best and we will deliver it to you, whether you actually like it or not. Um, and shifting the way that we think about our service and our customers and our residents and whatever it is, whatever label it is that we want to put on them. Because more and more, they expect us to be acting the same way as the types of businesses that aren't government based that they're interacting and transacting with. You know, they want to get their service at a time and place and at a mode that suits them. 
Um, and if you take the example of the banking sector, for example, which had traditionally been the most conservative, but if it's good enough for them to, um, you know, accept a transaction and deal with us um, in our banking business online with a key code, um, those sorts of things, and it's secure enough for them, well, why isn't it um, possible and secure enough for council to receive a change of address notification or, you know, move a... Um, dog registration from the city of Stonington to the city of, of Glen Ira. Um, so, you know, if it's good enough for them, why isn't it good enough for us? And that significantly, you know, that expectation has then started to drive perceptions of how they think about um, local government. And I think that, you know, as part of that, we need to be far more, um, far more agile um, and thinking about things, really putting ourselves in the customers' in the customers' shoes. Um, and the other is that I think that you know views and perceptions of local government are shared far more frequently than they might have been in the past as well. And social media has played a really key part of that. So a, if a customer is not happy with us, um, they find it very easy to actually share that view now. Um, and that in turn shapes perception, coming back to the issue that I was talking about earlier. Um, but I didn't want to leave customer centricity just talking about technology, because I think that we sort of spend a lot of time um, at flash conferences and webinars and those sorts of things, sorry, Fergal, uh, talking about digital transition, transformation, talking about efficiency, service reviews, harder, faster, sharper, cheaper, um, smarter, and technology is the answer to many of those things. But actually, there'll always be those who fall through the cracks. And for local government, I think we need to also remember when we're thinking about the customer, it is not just about um, the technology and the service elements of those, but actually we have a role in servicing those people who fall through the cracks um, and how we make sure that we maintain that sort of balance around um, our approach, that it's not just one thing, technology, digitisation, et cetera, is part of a suite of ways that we actually cater for um, our community. And I'll just leave you with one example of that. Um, so libraries, during lockdown, libraries transitioned to a click and collect model. Um, you think if you're gonna have click and collect, you actually need a click in order to then collect. Um, but you know, we had a resident who relied on actually going to the library to have access to a computer. So he couldn't click and collect. It might've normally been socially isolated. So what he did was each week, he wrote down on a piece of paper what that he'd like some books. He put it through the chute. Our staff took that note, used that as his click and collect request, and then um, enabled him to have um, to collect his books, uh, which enabled him to sort of maintain good peace of mind and those sorts of things during COVID. So for me, that's citizen centricity about how we think about and put our customers right in the centre of what we do. Thanks, John. You're on mute. You're on mute, John. I got to do that. Hooray. <laughs> there we go. Uh, that's a great, in fact, last example is a great example of uh, citizen, citizen, um, the citizen focus, Rebecca. It's not about the technology. Technology is the enabler, but it's all about what are the, what are the citizens' needs and how do we best engage with all citizens. Uh, our next panel member is Jolene. Jolene, oh my Jolene's with us. Yes. If Jolene unmutes. I think she's having issues, John. I'm working through it with her. Of course, the gremlins would come out today. Um, do you want to run to Colin and I'll see if we can dial Jolene in. Okay. I'll let, we'll come back to Jolene shortly. At this stage, then we'll, move, we'll go to Colin. Colin, welcome. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say about citizen centricity and technology. Okay. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Excellent. Um, just to follow up with a couple of things Rebecca said. So one, I'm not a technologist, John. You set me up to fail there. So, <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I, I um, understand technology enough to understand where we're at. I think just say a couple of things on the back of what Rebecca said. One is that yeah, technology is changing at a, a rapid pace. And I think... Um, it's almost ex yeah, a couple of people have said it's like exponential in its growth. So if you look at some of the big platform 
companies that we're all used to, like the Facebooks and Googles, and that they're, they're growing and morphing at a, a rapid pace. And our customers in local government starting to use those services, whereas local government only changing at incremental pace. And I think there's going to be a gap um, increasingly between what the punter expects and what the councils can deliver. I think that's a challenge for local government. The second thing is, and I just did a conference recently on digital inclusion across Australia, and it was just horrifying to see that for you know, citizens to participate in, in government generally and be a, a, a true citizen, I think there's about 1.2, most people have access to the internet, by the way, but there's about 1.2 million adult Australians who actually don't use it. So they're sort of excluded in a way, and there's lots of reasons. One is because they can't afford it, um, education, um, just want to do it. And there's just quite a, a, an alarming gap going on because as government, particularly local government, moves towards digital, I think I agree with what Rebecca said. We need to be really focused in on um, those, including everybody in that journey. So I think that's a, a, a really important point. I was just gonna say a few things. One is that um, technology, and I did a, a white paper recently on on uh, CX and EX in local government and you know, EX being employee experience. And one of the things that came up pretty clearly by speaking to a lot of people was around trust. And you know, if, if the citizen trusts the local government to deliver on the basic services, and I'm sorry if I've stolen Jolene's line here, um, then, then they'll trust you to do the bigger community engagement stuff. But if they lose trust with you, that important role of community building community and building the whole, you know, the, the bigger program of works for the broader community gets a bit watered down because there's no trust you to do the basics. So getting the basics right is important. And I think you mentioned before, John, technology as an enabler, I think that's exactly right. And it's this thing about digital and, you know, what is this thing digital? We used to say what it is. I think it is actually the thing now for government that the government is digital in a sense which means that the councils being joined up in internally so that from the customer, there's a flow from the customer into the service provider. And it's, it's frictionless, I think is probably the best word. Um, frictionless, so they get a service that they expect and there's not a lot of human handover in the middle and they can um, you know, engage with councils easily. Now, I think you know, the challenge for councils going forward is we've come from a model which was pretty much built around property. Um, you know, property centricity, and, and, I'll, and I will talk some tech. And we've built systems based on old technology that's focused on property. And you know, obviously, rates and um, property are important to councils, but we're now moving towards a discussion around customer, customer centricity. And there's a lag, I think, between the way a lot of council systems are built and designed and architected, and the way we want to move towards customer and actually getting you know, access to customer data having a single view of a customer, being able to do you know, much more enhanced service deliveries to the customer requires a different thinking. And I think technology may be an enabler, but also maybe a blocker to some of that change happening quickly. So I think some of the challenges in um, councils is actually getting to be able to deal with the core of the operation, which is your finance and your, your rates, but also being able to do with the, deal with some of the other services we deliver, which are much more customer focused. I think the challenge also for councils is that the core is probably going to remain the same, but around the edge of council, um, services are going to come and go from council. So you know, be controversial. One day you may not be running childcare, but you know, if you lose childcare, can you just pull it out of your system and move on and keep going? And Or you may, may take on another service. So I think this sort of edge stuff around councils is also important and it's informed by technology. And I think, um, you know, we still haven't got it entirely right yet within the technology field. And I think we're, you know, we're playing a bit of catch up. And I think executives like uh, Rebecca and I know Jolene are ahead of the curve and um, technology can be chasing its tail a bit and trying to keep up with it. And I think there's a, there's a real challenge for technologists to be actually make themselves more focused on customer and build that sort of, uh, um, I suppose, change the mindset, help change the mindset of the organisation towards a focus on customer and service. And I think that's um, pretty important. Um, I can keep going, John, but I'm maybe going to have to... No, no, it's... Darling. Okay, well, well, thank you, Colin. Um, Virgil, do we have... We Jolene? have Jolene. I think we have finally have her. The gremlins have oh, gone beautiful. away, thank God. 
and my heart pressure is coming down a little bit, John. So, um, yeah, so I think <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> Jolene, welcome. It's so, so good to hear and see you. Uh, uh, did a reboot, you know. Uh, hello. We should know that. We should know that, shouldn't we? Reboot, reboot. Well, welcome, Jolene. I'll Thank you. hand over to you at this point. Thanks. And it was great to hear from Rebecca as a uh, CEO who clearly has her finger on the pulse when it comes to CX. Very important contributor, I think, to um, citizen centricity. And apologies, I didn't quite catch all of yours, um, Colin, but I'm sure you would have talked about things like trust and technology is only part of the picture. Um, so I wanted to cover off on probably a bit of both of those, if I could. Um, just to talk about myself very quickly, I'm the Director of Customer Relations at the City of Melbourne. I look after Contact Centre, Voice of Customer, and I have a small CX team. Um, so we often talk about customer or well, citizen centricities at putting the citizens at the heart of everything an organisation does. And for me, it really is uh, about organisation having a deep understanding of who their customers are, what their needs are, what their expectations are, their preferences, and most importantly, what they value. Highly customer-centric organisations for me have the systems, the data structures, the processes, the services, programs, and of course, they must need um, a bit of money to do that, to deliver on those needs. But the organisations must also have really highly engaged employees if they want to be truly customer-centric and constructive and collaborative cultures. They also must have very committed CEOs and senior leaders. I wanted to talk today a little bit about um, what the City of Melbourne is doing to build better, a better understanding of um, customers, starting with some measurement and metrics. So, Fergal, if you could pop onto the first slide, that'd be great. Um, Rebecca and Colin have probably talked about the expectations, and I know that you did, Rebecca, surely, about um, customer exp expectations arising, and they are expecting organisations like ours to be contemporary in the way that they deliver services and experiences. Um, they, want, they want it to be quick and efficient. They want to deal with very professional people. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of attributes that you all know that they need uh, to um, experience of organisations like local governments. Um, but sometimes to really, I guess, demonstrate the need, you need to surface the data on what customers are actually saying. And um, the Community Satisfaction Survey is one way of doing that. But at customer, in customer relations at the City of Melbourne, we've created a voice of customer program. So we measure um, customer experience and first contact resolution and channel shift as well are part of a dashboard that goes to ELT every four weeks. The CX score is a measure of the experience of customers at the closure of all cases that are created in our CRM. The survey is issued 24 hours after this case has been closed. And we have a proxy MPS question, um, which you can see there, which asks customers a question that says, Based on your service experience today, how would you rate the city of Melbourne? How would you speak of the city of Melbourne rather to your family, friends, and colleagues? One is negative if not asked. One is negative if asked. Three is neutral, and it goes up the stream to five positive if asked, positive if not asked. So five, four, and five scores are proxy promoters. Um, customers also have the opportunity to leave a verbatim statement on why they rated the score that they did. Um, so that's a little bit about the customer experience score and the way we gather insights from customers. Um, didn't want to go into the other ones because they're measures that are important, but generally related to the import, where the organisation places the value on those things. But I really want to talk about this headline metric. So I posed the question to our ELT recently. In the city of possibility, which is our new 10-year community vision for our organisation, are you happy with City of Melbourne delivering average service experiences. And I could do that because I had some data to support that conversation. So we were successful in um, having ELT agree to have every director, um, and at the City of Melbourne, there's GMs and directors and managers, um, every director to have a CX measure, a 5% uplift if they have one, have already have a metric, um, but they also must have an improvement plan in their performance plans. And this is to happen now, and it will be an ongoing requirement across the board. 
Um, next slide, please, Fergal. Um, I just wanted to quickly say that we, um, some legacies of my friend on the panel here, Colin, um, we have some great, um, great tools at our fingertips. Um, one of the things that we've been able to do is surface a lot of the data that's collected um, from our CRM into Power BI dashboards. And as you can see on the left, you can drill right down to service level. Um, you can look at it at a group level. The CEO can look at it from an organisational point of view. And on this page, it's metrics that are about operational performance. But in the next slide, Virgil, you can see where um, the customer experience is sitting at. So on the bottom left-hand side are the, um, all of the um, cases where customers have rated their scores as neutral or detractors. And on the right-hand side at the bottom is the, all of the cases and the, what customers are actually saying about their experience um, as positive um, or promoted type people. Um, so you can see, on, it's sorry about the fidelity, I don't think it's as clear as it could be, but you can drill right down in a live dashboard at all times and see where all the services are. This, is, this data is available to all employees from the CEO right down to anyone who has um, an interest in looking at how they're scoring. Next slide, please. Uh, quickly, um, just a quick one. We've also done this for our contact centre. Um, we've got some pretty old, um, a pretty old phone system um, and we don't have other, other abilities to um, join up a lot of our data in the contact centre at the moment. It's on our um, roadmap. Uh, but we have been able to bring in disparate data, so data sets into a Power BI dashboard again to surface that information to, um, to me and to anyone who wants to have a look at it. Um, next slide, please. Um, so what we do from those that measurement is to bring all of that verbatim comments, drag it out of a system, put it into another one, an analytics system, and then we can start to see um, the really headline measures. This is organisational data, not service by service data, but we can drill down to a service. Um, but what the main pain points for our customers actually are, and um, no surprises, communication, I reckon that's uh, a common thing across all councils, but communication and lack of closing the loop is, a, is one of the biggest contributors to a negative score. Um, timeliness, lack of resolution, and then sort of dissatisfaction with service overall is in there as well. Next slide, please. And then, um, you know, what is it that customers value from their service experiences? Um, and you can see there on the right-hand side, um, we're seeing that people are really valuing self-serve options for really non-complicated matters. And that is because we have built digital journeys for lots of our services. I think when it becomes complex, and I might talk about that um, through the conversation a bit further on, um, that when things are still, we still got a bit of a way to go on very complex journeys um, and humans are still a big factor in um, supporting those. So that's um, the next dot point there. Um, next slide, please. Um, but, you know, metrics are one part of the story. What you do with the metrics is where the rubber hits the road. Um, so in terms of supporting the organisation to really build uh, an improvement plan, so a plan to lift CX across the organisation, my team has been working across the organisation for every single branch. At the, it's a big it's a big job that we're doing at the moment to establish a way of measuring CX if, in, if there isn't already one. So that dashboard is for a, a, a large part of our business, but it doesn't include some parts of our business. So for example, um, our legal service previously wouldn't have measured the experience of their customers within the organisation. And we're actually bringing that into um, the requirements. So the legal cert service, the finance, finance services, technology services are all part of that mix. Um, and they are at the moment designing surveys or doing, doing um, creating ways of interviewing their customers to determine what they value so that they can build their improvement plan. Um, and clearly there's different types of levels of maturity across the organisation. Um, and that's to be expected. You know, people delivering frontline services are going to be different to those who are who are potentially doing back of house stuff. So, um, you know, 
we're on we're on a journey. There's different levels of maturity. Um, I'll just finally say that some people are running at this with gusto, and we've got some really fantastic early adopters. But as I said, there's different levels of maturity. Um, and when people sort of push up against me and say, but you know, I write policies and I write strategies and I'm, I'm saving the city or I'm recovering, helping the city recover. Um, and I think um, Colin and I talk about this a little bit. It's the daily interactions that customers have with the organisation that builds experience trust. And experience trust and macro trust are absolutely aligned. So macro trust is a measure of citizens' trust that governments are acting in their best interests, which helps governments win the hearts and minds of its citizens. And acting in their best interest is actually what the state government gazettes local government to do. So it's the reason why we're here. So thank you for that. Nicole, uh, Jolene, they are an impressive set of da impressive data capture and metrics presentation. Okay. We'll now move on to some questions and please, uh, everyone attending, use the, uh, the chat box, the chat function to, uh, to, load, to lodge any questions you may have and Fergal will monitor that. But perhaps I could start the questions uh, with yourself, Rebecca. Um, what do you think local uh, citizens' wants and needs are from a, from a CEO's perspective at, uh, versus the citizens' wants and needs from a, a, a councillor's perspective. Is there a difference? Are they the same? Is there a translation in there? I, I'm not sure that for the most part our citizens actually um, see a For many of our citizens, they don't necessarily see a significant delineation between the role of the organisation and the role of the councillors. And, and while I think we do, because we understand, um, you know, how our respective roles are embedded within statute and all of those sorts of things. I'm not sure it really matters um, to the residents. But I think in terms, of, in terms of their elected representatives, they want to make sure that they're listening to them, that they're taking their views and perspectives into consideration and, and those sorts of things. But they expect the same of the organisation. You know, they tell us that they, they want to be involved in decisions that impact them, that they want to be able to, you know, shape um, and provide input into things that will impact their amenity and the areas that they live in and those sorts of things. What we find, though, is that it's far more difficult and challenging to try and get them engaged in matters that are more macro, so um, items that are sort of whole, whole, of, whole of municipality or, or strategies or those sorts of things. But when the strategy, when the rubber hits the road on a strategy, and it might mean that, you know, I don't know, let's take, for example, a parking policy and you know, parking is going to be removed from out the front of their building or something like that, then um, of course they want to they want to hear from us and, and give us their view and perspective quite quickly. Um, but in terms of service provision, I think, you know, each of Jolene and Colin and and that you know, they've all touched on elements today of, you know, they just want fast, efficient, non-bureaucratic, um, responsive services at a time and a place that is suitable and convenient to them. Um, you know, the last thing that you want to do if you're having to do something that you don't want to do or you're being compelled to do anyway, such as paying a, paying a bill or paying a fine or those sorts of things, you want to do it in the most efficient way possible. And that doesn't involve um, coming into a town hall, standing in a long queue, and then um, finding that the person who's at the other end of the service queue isn't actually able to meet your, meet your requirements. So, you know, they don't want to be passed pass from person to person and they don't want um, excuses. What they actually want is a resolution there and then. Thank you, Rebecca. Colin, the, you spoke about technology and um, the transition in terms of local government's um, technology focus was uh, started out being property-based and there's now a transition to being customer-based. How best do you think local government can respond to closing that gap or implementing or moving to a customer-based technology focus as opposed to a property-based, is, is the historic property-based focus? Oh, we got John. 
<laughs> I, I think that's a, a, a challenging question for a number of reasons. And I think we are definitely in a transition. I think some of the older local government systems that have been around for 20 years or more still have within their architecture a property model. And I know I'm getting into more detail here, but we, we step back a bit and say, what do we want to know about a customer? We want data on our customers. So we want to know how our customers are feeling about the service, which Jolene has highlighted, you know, it's from the, her CX scores, but you also want to know how they're engaging with the different service providers in the council and they're getting what they want. And you, you, I think in the longer term data about customers means that we want to get into even more predictive um, service delivery towards our customers and, and provide them with that sort of value add that, goes, you know, which the commercial enterprises are starting to move towards. So I think that's the, the future. But if you're building um, data that has customer as an attribute of a property rather than a property being an attribute of a customer, it's a whole mind shift set. And I think that's the challenge with the tech. And that's why I think you're seeing a number of councils, a lot of councils, in fact, replatforming John, because they can't solve the conundrum on the old tech. So they're, they're replatforming. Um, and I think that's a, an interesting approach and it's going to be a slow approach. And so we, we need to be able to look towards modern systems, but at the same time be able to deliver on the standard services. So I, I, I like to use a sort of a technology term called pace layering. You start to focus on the core, which is what I said before, property, rating, finance, um, you know, and, and assets probably, and then leave the other stuff to be a bit more fluid. So. Jolene and I, when we're together at Melbourne, we put in a new CRM based around the need to change the conversation towards customer. And Jolene and I could speak for hours and hours and hours how challenging that was and probably still is challenging for Jolene around the property people who have a mindset around property and they don't trust customer. They don't trust customer data. It's not, it's not a con constrained within a cadastra and all this sort of stuff. And it's, it's an ongoing challenge. And I think it's mindset and it requires senior leaders to understand that customers matter, as does property matters. But you've got to have a way of dealing with them both. And I think the system changes uh, profound for local government. We're still finding our way through that. But most councils are now looking towards a, a more uh, replatforming with a bit of you know um, agility based around the edges to make sure they can deal with customers quickly. I think I've probably said enough and I probably haven't answered your question fully. But. No, no, you, you have. I, I think the point you make there, Colin, it's not a matter of I, when it comes to uh, property-based, property-focused mm. or customer-focused. It's not either or, it's both. Yeah, both absolutely. Are, both are important. Mm. John, I've got a question. I might just, sorry to jump in. Uh, for it. Um, from uh, Christy at, at Shepparton uh, that I, we might put to the, to the panel. Um, how have CX experiences changed during the pandemic where residents have, are supported virtually and have been unable to fa receive face-to-face -face support? What adaptations have councils made? Any takers? That might be a good question for Jolene because it reflects a question I was going to ask Jolene about given the, you know, the impact of COVID-19, particularly on Melbourne, people working, you know, the CBD, people working from home. Mm. Um, that question from Shepparton's, great one. How has that, what's the ongoing legacy of, of uh, COVID-19, Jolene, from your perspective at the City of Melbourne in terms of customer experiences? Sure. Um, I think we were pretty well set up as an organisation from a customer point of view to head into COVID actually. Um, a lot of those services that um, most of our customers would use on a regular basis have been digitised. So we were very, very fortunate. Um, we had had a flexible working model um, that, and a flexible working policy and ability to work remotely um, that was really, uh, I guess, in a in a sort of fairly low level um, stage at the time of COVID, and the tech team in the background, you know, the capability was there, but the capacity wasn't there. So the tech team worked really, really hard to stand that up very, very quickly. And I don't think there was much um, loss of service, to be frank. Um, but what we we sort of stuck around until right to the end. 
I think uh, my last day at work was something about something like the 27th of March um, when we closed down the service centre um, reluctantly, but um, importantly for um, the best interests of our staff at the time. Um, we, a lot of the work that we um, give in a face-to-face -face type arrangement is payments, um, but we did transition to a cashless front desk probably about a year and a half prior to that. Um, permits, so things like park, interim parking permits and stuff, and because we weren't doing a lot of enforcement, those sorts of services weren't needed as much anymore. And what we ended up doing is um, a lot of our back of house service people um, were still coming in in terms of issuing permits and we had to mail them out. Uh, but we transferred some of our contact centre staff in to be able, because they could issue them at the front desk, um, actually doing a lot of the back of house admin to support the permits team so that we could get them out. So we just moved, moved labour from one part of the business to another and worked collaboratively with our team. Um, so that's how we transitioned. I think there was also, um, you know, lots of things that lots of things like libraries and things have done where they've, you know, established click and collect type services. Um, but as far as I'm aware, very little diminution of service. One thing that City of Melbourne also did was anyone that was um, unable to work in a, in a front facing service was redeployed to another essential service where it was necessary so that they could maintain their roles, which was fantastic, such a fantastic thing for our organisation to do for its um, long serving staff particularly, um, but to help with other services. So we stood up a business concierge service out of our contact centre as well. And we had redeploys from tourism and recreation centres and those types of things to support the community in the business, in the business concierge service. So um, that was super important and um, a very big commitment from our Lord Mayor to uh, make a care call to every single small or medium business in the municipality. Um, which was an epic event, I must say. Thank you, Jolene. Rebecca, could I invite you to come in on this and perhaps add a, a, a bit of a twist to it? Like Christy's uh, question there, how have customer experiences changed during the pandemic where residents are uh, supported virtually and have been unable to receive face-to-face -face support? What adaption, adaptions have councils made? And can I add to that, what are the ongoing, how, how does... What are the ongoing implications? Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. And um, you know, we had some similar experiences to what Jolene has um, spoken about at City of Melbourne. Um, and I guess one of the early reflections that I'd say is that um, if the council wasn't well progressed in terms of um, technological and cultural transformation, in terms of readiness they didn't adapt quite as well as those who had already invested in some of that stuff. So, um, you know, in Glenara, we were working remotely within a process of about three or four days um, of shutdowns being, um, you know, announced and those sorts of things. And we were able to be really quite agile on that. But you're right, John, there's been, um, you know, I think that some of the changes that we put in place during COVID are now going to be embedded as ongoing because they've become expectations of our community. So things like, um, you know, running leisure services online so that people could actually access um, their, you know, a, I'll call it, a, I'll show my age, I'll call it aerobics, um, but their, their le, you know, their leisure activities and all of those sorts of things online, um, arts and culture events and things like that. So by taking that stuff online, we've actually increased the reach so people who may not have previously been able to engage with those programs were able to engage with those programs, which included, you know, the elderly and, and people with disabilities and those sorts of things that may have found it more difficult or people with, you know, agoraphobia who may have found it more difficult to engage in um, traditional ways actually found it better for them. So I think what we'll find is that these multimodal ways of operating our business will now become part of the way that we work in local government because it actually enables us to service more of our community, more of the diversity in our community in a better way. And the other thing that we found was that, you know, we had a transformation program in place, but what we needed to do was to actually change some of the priorities within that. So some of the things that we thought that we might um, invest in 
over the last couple of years, we've put slightly to the side and said, actually, they can wait, but really we need to accelerate having a chat bot operating, for example, on our website or accelerate the, um, you know, really making SnapSend Solve work from an end-to-end -end perspective so that actually um, while people were out and about and walking around our neighbourhoods, um, they could easily access and log um, issues so that we could then log those as a service request, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I think that the, the lasting impact is the expectation that actually we don't just go back to face-to-face -face service delivery now, we stay as a multimodal operation. And that will be challenging because that will bring, you know, costs and impacts and those sorts of things, but it's a better customer experience. Thank you for that, Rebecca. I think that's a really pertinent point. It adds to the customer's expectations and standards of, but they've just been raised. Good uh, I've got another couple of questions here, if, unless you want to ask some other ones coming through. Oh, I was Mindful just going to time. acknowledge a former colleague of mine at uh, Kingston, Brooke. Uh, welcome, Brooke. And Brooke's got a question for Jolene. Jolene, how important is organisational structure when it comes to cultural change in customer centricity? Mm, that's a great question, Brooke. Um, I think one of, from my perspective, one of the biggest shifts that we've had is bringing teams together to solve problems. Um, so we have um, a space in our organisation called City Lab where they do um, a lot of service reimagining uh, and they bring teams together to solve customer problems and to redesign services. And I think that um, opportunity of getting people together from who have different roles in the customer journey is so super important. Um, and we recently, I think lots of councils have been through the better approvals process, but there was a, you know, a six week sprint, which was essentially bringing together health officers, customer relations people from our planning area, engineering area, all sorts of people um, together to uh, cut red tape for um, starting small businesses in the city of Melbourne, um, which actually gave rise to the, con the business concierge service that we're about to launch as a start a new business, have this one-stop shop uh, when on the 15th of, <laughs> um, 15th of March in um, last year. So we pivoted at that pr pretty quickly to a different um, type of service, but still in the concierge um, realm. So super important. And um, I think culture is the final bastion of customer centricity. Um, the city of Melbourne's been measuring um, culture using a particular model that is really quite accessible for all staff and everyone is committed to, all directors have a requirement to have a cultural action plan. And um, I feel like the culture has lifted, the organisation's more collaborative and more positive. And I, I really believe that's starting to improve the customer experience quite a lot. Thanks. Fergal, do we have? I think yeah, we have I've some got another questions. colleague of yours, uh, Sarah Bishop, uh, who. Hi, uh, Sarah. That was a great question. Uh, councils do a lot of community engagement around visions, strategies, policies, projects, etc. Yet often this data is used once to inform the particular piece of work and then goes nowhere else. Do you think this data has a place in building an overall understanding of your community in addition to service request type interactions? Uh, if so, how could this be achieved? I know I've discussed this with Sarah and myself at times. So yeah, that's a great question. Would you like me to lean in on that one? Yep. Go for if it. If you like, if anyone else has um, would like to, otherwise I'm happy to. Um, we, we're actually uh, doing that. We're just starting that journey at the City of Melbourne, actually. Um, so we've got a... Um, new community, like a just very recently um, new community development team at the City of Melbourne and um, the City Lab team that I spoke about earlier, customer relations and the city and the community development team are getting together with our data team and we're actually having a look at how we can produce a neighbourhood data bank on customer. Um, so looking at all the disparate customer data sets and, and trying to really bring it in together to having a, you know, a suburb by suburb as well as customer group, customer persona type view of, um, of all of the data that we have collected in the organisations. And that is super exciting, I reckon. Super, super exciting. So it definitely does have a place. 
Colin, I know you wanted to jump in. I see in chat. Do you want to have your tuppence worth? I'm just mindful of time, John. Another five minutes. But uh... yeah, thanks, Virgil. I was just going back to that culture thing, and I, I, I have a view that councils, um, the culture part's really critical because if it, it, uh, you know, if a CEO from 1920 rocked up into a council in 2020, they'd probably find themselves not too lost. They'd probably get shocked by the number of um, computers and they might get shocked by the fact there's lots of female CEOs because it'd be a male CEO from 1920. But a lot of the functions are actually still the same and local government's still on this cha transition, I think, to a corporate type role. So there's a lot of what I call artisan practitioners in councils. Engineers are artisans, they practice engineering and there's you know, property people who practice property stuff and plan it. And they, they've all got this long history within local government. I think it's hard to get them to get out of that mindset and start thinking it's getting better and it needs leadership, but to actually get out of that mindset and start thinking more broadly about the organisation as, as, as a, a, a maker of place and a maker of customer experience. And I think, you know, and, and regulating place and things like that that councils do and not just deliver a particularly narrow service. You know, I fix drains or I do, you know, I, I go and do a building inspection. I think that's a broader issue for culture that's still being challenged. And I think it takes um, CEOs and leaders to actually start embedding that. And I think the other point I'd say is you don't need to get any change unless, you know, if you can't manage it, you can't measure it. You know, you've got to measure it to manage it, basically. And I think actually, as Jolene showed, putting in sort of challenges within executives um, performance plans to actually deliver on that change is really critical. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Final question. I'm going to ask this one, John. Two tips for, we've got, you know, we've got plenty of other councils on this listening in to some of the great work that um, Rebecca, you're doing and, and Jolene also. Any tips for maybe some smaller councils? How did I get started on becoming customer centric mm. in 30 seconds or less? What, what, what would your <laughs> advice be from what you've learned, uh, I guess, um, over the last number of years? You've got to drink the Kool-Aid and then make sure that it is embedded through. So, you know, your CEO need, and your executive need to be believers. That would be my, my tip because if they're behind it, then it'll actually ha it'll happen. I could talk for ages, but I'll, I won't. I'll let others come in. Absolutely, Rebecca. And um, I think I did a stint with um, my friends in Wangaratta on a comet once and um, I had a great culture in that organisation and they delivered great experiences because they are close to the community and they're part of the community. Um, so don't forget your customers might be your friends, your family, and they're humans just like you. So just treat them the way that you would like to be treated. Are you there, Colin? Colin? Oh, I've got nothing to add to that. I think both of you are absolutely correct. And as a customer of local government, I think it's, um, you know, it, it's been, uh, my, I, think, I think it's often about sort of the journeys you have at different times and, you know, you need councils at certain times and then you don't think about them a lot. But I think as Jolene said, you know, you are a member of a community and you and, and, you want to be treated like the way you, you treat others. And I think that's really important. I think local government's um, really kicking goals at the moment in that space, you know, particularly on the back of COVID. So that's all I want to say. Wonderful. John, I might hand over to you. We, we could keep going here for another hour, I think. Um, it's we've, we've answered a lot of uh, questions and I'm sure it's raised plenty more, but um, maybe we'll hand over to you to do a vote of thanks and uh, some closing remarks. Thank you, Fergal. Well, firstly, to Rebecca, Colin and Jolene, thank you so much for giving us some of your uh, precious time today to, uh, to be part of this webinar. Your comments have been, all your comments have been insightful and thought provoking. It's, uh, this is a journey, this customer centricity journey that local governments are, it doesn't stop. I think it just keeps evolving and the challenge it's an ongoing challenge to, for uh, all local governments to be aware of what are their customers' expectations? How does local government best respond? But Rebecca, you made the point in your uh, initial comments around, we can't leave anyone, local government can't leave anyone behind either. It's gotta be all embracing. And as we, uh, both you and Jolene and Colin, um, made mention of COVID-19 and the implications of that, as we come out of COVID-19, 
the experiences now that customers have around being able to access services and make inquiries and complaints online and that move to being online virtual is not going to diminish. It keeps increasing. But as we've heard today, local government should be very confident about its ability to respond to those challenges because we certainly have people on our panel today who are up for it, who are demonstrating they're actually doing it now and providing some great examples and insights for all of us. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Jolene. Uh, and to everyone who joined us today, it's been a pleasure to host you on this webinar and we look forward to, uh, to catching up with you all again in the new year. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.